Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rory Martirana, and I'm here with my colleague, Emily Raymond. We are both reference and adult services librarians at the New Haven Free Public Library. We're very honored to welcome our guest this evening, Charles Spencer, Nine Pearl Spencer. Uh, Lord Spencer is an author, a public speaker, a broadcaster and journalist. He's the author of seven nonfiction books, including the book we're here to discuss this evening, The White Ship, Conquest, Anarchy, and the Wrecking of Henry I Dreams. Um, as a broadcaster, Lord Spencer worked for NBC News as an on-air correspondent from 1986 to 1995, primarily for the Today Show, but also for Sunday Guardian, or for Today, the Nightly News, and NBC Super Channel. And as a print journalist, he's written in the UK for The Guardian, The Independent on Sunday, Financial Times, Daily Telegraph, and many others. Um, welcome, Lord Spencer. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Rory. Well, during my uh broadcasting career that you mentioned, I had a very happy time in Connecticut doing a documentary on the Glass House with Philip, jo jo uh, Philip Johnson in New Haven, I think it was. Uh, no, Canaan, New Canaan. So uh, I'm delighted to be back and uh, happy to talk about the white ship. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, also, before we begin, I just want to clarify, while we do welcome audience questions this evening, we will only be entertaining questions related specifically to the white ship in the surrounding time period. So should you have a question for Lord Spencer, please submit it if you're on Zoom through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, just so it doesn't get lost in our chat. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can go ahead and comment on the video and we'll try to get that answered for you. Um, and Emily, I'm going to hand it over to you for the first question. So again, Lord Spencer, welcome. Uh, my first question is, what about the wreck of the white ship inspired you to write this book? Well, I'm probably double your age, if I can put it that way. And when I was young in England, uh, history was compulsory subject at the school. And we had a very broad base of uh, history to learn. And I remember learning about Henry I, who, who reigned from 1100 to 1135. And the one thing that, they, that stuck with me from that period uh, was the sinking of the white ship, which seemed to me such an incredibly dramatic moment, just one moment changing the course of history forever. Uh, and particularly, there's a moment in the sinking of the white ship where William, the prince, could have got away to safety, uh, but he hears his sister call for help and he rows back to try and help her and seals his own fate. So it was a childish reaction to a very important story. And I, I don't assume that the white ship is taught at all in American schools. I'm not sure it's really taught in English schools anymore. But if you look back to when Winston Churchill wrote the history of the English speaking people, uh, when he talks about this event, this terrible episode where uh, the, the, the Titanic of it day sinks, uh, he apologizes for bringing it up again because it's such a hackneyed subject. So I think probably the same with American history, things go in and out of uh, fashion and the white ship is most definitely out of fashion now. And with the 900th anniversary coming up, uh, uh, the November before last, I thought, well, now's the time to bring this story back to life. And so that's what I did. Thank you. Uh, Rory, did you have a question? You're muted. Sorry about that. All right, so there are so many people involved in this history and the story. Many of them happen to have the same name. Um, I just wanted to say you did a great job distinguishing for the reader one from another within the book. Um, how did you keep them all straight though while you were writing and researching? It seems like that might be a little daunting. It's so interesting because I was reconnecting with characters I knew from the past. So. When I was at um, Oxford uh, University, this period of English history was my specialist area. So I, you, it's funny when you get to know people in your late teens, early twenties, you, you, you sort of feel you know them, even though it's through history. 
Uh, but what I would say was so interesting for me was putting this story together. I learned so much more. And, 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 and so let me explain a little bit to those who are joining this talk who haven't read the book and certainly don't know about the white ship. And I'm assuming that's most people joining us. So essentially we're dealing with a period after the conquest of England. So I start with 1066 because we can all hang our hat on that uh, with William the Conqueror capturing England. Uh, but we, I, I, I take the reader through the period of uh, Norman conquest, uh, which is a pretty bloody affair. Unbelievable if you think about it. So the population of England at this time was probably 1.5 million. And William the Conqueror, you know, we think of him from this distance, if we think of him as tall, as this all powerful military man. But throughout his reign of England, uh, the 21 years where he was on the throne of England, he was constantly in fear of somebody else coming across the sea to steal the English crown. Uh, and he was particularly nervous about the Scandinavians coming to Northeast England and, and mounting an invasion there. And so after the uh, successful uh, winning of England in 1066, he goes north uh, up to the Northeast coast, which is opposite uh, Sweden and Norway and destroys it. And we reckon 100,000 of the 1.5 million Englishmen died at this period. So this is a period of great savagery. It's like Game of Thrones, except it really happened. And so I, I take the reader through that and through William the Conqueror's family, which is a really key part of this. We think of these kings and queens and emperors and empresses of the past as standalone figures, but just like all of us, we're part of a family. Uh, William the Conqueror had very complicated relationships with his children, particularly his sons. He had four sons. Uh, one of them, Richard, died very early in a, in a hunting accident, which was a, a common fate at this time among the royals and aristocracy of Europe. And so he's left with three sons. And the eldest one, uh, Robert, is a complicated figure who doesn't like his father very much and is essentially in, in, uh, in active warfare against William the Conqueror for, for much of the, the time that they overlap. And then there's a second son, William Rufus, who's a, 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 a rather uncomplicated soldier. And then the one who's left is Henry, who becomes Henry I. And he's sort of the hero of this book. He's the backdrop figure. And so in many ways, this is a sort of biography of Henry I, this extraordinary youngest son of the conqueror who no one expects much of, but who is very learned, very sly, uh, ready to grasp his chance. And he, first of all, manages to be in the hunting party uh, where his elder brother, William Rufus, is king of England by this stage, is killed by a stray arrow. Nobody's ever quite worked out where that arrow came from. Uh, and then he defeats his eldest brother, Robert, and captures Normandy as well. So this youngest brother becomes King of England and Duke of Normandy. And he takes the throne in 1100 and over the next 20 years sorts out all the problems that face a medieval king. He produces an heir. This is a very important part of the duties of a king at this time to produce somebody who everyone can rally around and see as the focal point of the future. He deals with the overmighty aristocracy. He makes friends with the church and very important for an English king at this time, he defeats the French, uh, becomes a sort of uh, absolute imperative for Englishmen to beat the French. And all of this is going in the right direction until 1120, which is when this book climaxes, um, the 17 year old heir that he's produced is suddenly lost in this disaster at sea. And it puts all of Henry's dreams, all the plans he's so carefully laid out over the 20 years in charge in jeopardy and actually leads to utter turmoil and destruction and the end of the Norman dynasty. So that's really the, the backdrop to this tale. We have a bunch of questions from the audience already. So I, I want to make sure we get to some of those. Um, 
So let's see. Um, of the primary sources about the family of William the Conqueror that still survive, what was the most compelling source that you studied in your research to create the book? It's a very good question. So my three previous books were on the English Civil Wars of the mid 17th century. And, and unlike your American Civil War, it's been endlessly written about and there are an enormous number of sources. Uh, and like your Civil War, it was the bloodiest conflict that this country has ever suffered in terms of loss of life. And that was a challenge in itself, you know, writing about uh, a war where there are competing pamphlets, sometimes talking about the same event, and you've got this sort of crazy uh, business going on where you, 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 one event is happening and two polarized reports are, are occurring as a result. Well, there was an element of that with this book. So we're dealing with a subject that's 900 years old. Um, that I came across nine primary sources and they're all religious people. So uh, only the people who were brought up in the church had the literacy to write these accounts as historians, as chroniclers. And at the same time, they have their own spin on it because they're men, or in one case, uh, a woman of God. And this is a very superstitious age, you know. Uh, people saw that there's no scientific knowledge to speak of. They saw everything as happening through God's will. And it's a very sort of profound belief it's uh, Christianity to strip back to its barest essentials. Uh, we're not talking about a New Testament God. They're not thinking of Jesus. They're not th uh, thinking of a sort of Christian ethic. They're thinking of an Old Testament God who is full of judgment and vengeance. And this is who's dominating their thinking. The same with the common man, to be honest. You know, they were thinking of a a, a, a very stripped back version of, of, of religious belief. And so my job as a writer, um, I, I'm a narrative historian, which means that I, I take strong stories and hopefully make them stronger by getting the facts right. But I'm not an academic historian who's trying to beat you over the head with uh, academic facts. Uh, I'm trying to drive a story. Uh, my background was given, I, I worked for the Today Show for 10 years, and I was taught when writing my scripts, always be visual, you know, try and drive a narrative through picture, right to picture. So when I write my books, I'm trying to illuminate the imagination of the reader. That's really key to me. So I'm taking nine religious texts, uh, chronicles uh, from 900 years ago, and I'm picking out the bits that are most persuasive as historical accuracy uh, and also most dramatic because they need to tell the story. And the question, the intricacy of the question was who was the most compelling? Well, it's a man with the most extraordinary name. He's called Orderic Vitalis. And he was an English boy from the Northwest of England from Shropshire. And his father was a French priest who had a view of uh, damnation and eternity, which persuaded him to send his son to live and serve in a monastery in Normandy. And this is incredibly lucky for us in terms of the story, because although he was essentially banished from his home and from his homeland, he became a chronicler, the historian in his monastery, but he always had an ear cocked towards uh, English stories. So when this most dramatic of English losses happened on the Norman coast, he is our man. And in the drama of the white ship, this is a sinking of a ship with 350 of the most important people in Europe on board, uh, including the only legitimate heir to the English throne. There is one survivor, and he is probably the humblest man on board. He's a butcher called Barreau from Rouen, the capital of Normandy. And what is he doing on a ship full of aristocrats? He's trying to get his debts paid. He's not sure when he's gonna see these people again, if ever. So he's managed to get on the ship to get money off them. And then it ends in disaster. So what happens is the prince is this, he's the epitome of glamour. He's surrounded by sycophants. 
Uh, they all get very drunk on the evening of the 25th of November, 1120. And they persuade the, the crew to join in the drinking. And this is the problem. The crew, the helmsman, they miscalculate the speed they're going. The oarsmen leave the harbor of Barfla. It's very near Omaha Beach from uh, D-Day. Uh, and they head north at a huge rate of knots. Uh, the, the oarsmen bending their backs. The captain drops the sail too quickly. They hit the key berth rock, which is still there today, and they go down. And the one man who survives out of the 350 on the white ship is Barrow the Butcher. And it is without doubt in my mind, we'll never have conclusive proof uh, that he sat down afterwards with or Derek Fatalis and gave his eyewitness account of what happened that terrible night. Because if you read all of these people, they have incredible detail. But Orderic Fatalis has the clash of oars and the, the screaming from the water and all the stuff that makes this such a terrible tragedy. Uh, he has it in such a strange focus that only somebody who was there could transmit it, I think. So if we're viewing this as a story, did you have a favorite character, like a favorite historical figure that you enjoyed writing about more than others? Yeah, this is a vicious time. So having a favorite, I, I, would, I would have to temper that by saying these are pretty appalling people by our standards. They, they are, it is Game of Thrones. It really is Game of Thrones. I really like Henry I. I think he's such a fascinating character. To be the youngest son, he was treated appallingly by his elder brothers. Uh, he looked after his father, uh, William the Conqueror, by the time he died was a rather bloated, uh, older man who took it took on one skirmish too many on horseback and got a the, the pommel the front of his saddle really hit him very hard in his stomach and ruptured it and William the Conqueror's lying ready to die on his deathbed being tended by Henry his youngest son and he says to Henry I'm going to leave England to my second son your brother William Rufus uh, because he'll be able to hold on to it. He's a warrior. And I'm going to leave Normandy to your eldest brother, even though I've been fighting him all these years, because he's still my rightful heir. And you're going to have some silver. And Henry is a pragmatist, and he goes, well, that's not very fair. I'm your most loyal son, and I'm here with you now. And it doesn't seem like a good idea just to give me that. And William the Conqueror on his deathbed comforts him by saying, one day you'll be greater than both, both your brothers. And I love that, the, the human drama of that. This isn't just about a king and a duke. It's about a family. It's about succession, the TV show. And um, it's about all these things where we're dealing with the real drama of life. And I like following Henry through this terrible youth. You know, when his father died, he uses his silver to buy various parts of West Normandy and up in Brittany, you know, Mont Saint-Michel, which some of you will know is this beautiful, uh, it's now a monastic island, which is separated at high tide from the mainland. Uh, but he, he buys that, and, but he has to defend himself on that. His brothers attack him. These are bad people, his brothers, you know, they, they, they want to take advantage of him and, and take, off, take away from him his poultry inheritance which they do, they cast him into prison, he goes into exile, we don't really know what happened to him, he wanders around France, this penniless knight. I mean, it's sort of cross between Robin Hood and you know, Robinson Crusoe, this sort of wandering lost person. And yet he's there to seize the throne of England when his brother is killed in a hunting accident. He rides first to Winchester in the south of England to seize the treasury. And then he goes to uh, Westminster Abbey in London and is crowned. And I mentioned how this is a period of uh, incredible Christian, I have to say superstition because it goes beyond normal religion. Uh, and if somebody is crowned in a, in a solemn coronation, then they are perceived as being semi-divine. Uh, they take on something that is not human. And even so, you know, he, he, his, his hold on the throne is quite fragile. He casts about for a suitable bride. 
He marries the uh, Scottish princess who is very eligible and seems they seem to have a love match. Uh, she has a direct connection to the true story of Macbeth, which I, I love bringing in these other tales. Um, her father kills the real life Macbeth in battle. Um, and I have to say, you know, it is fascinating casting back into these periods of history because the real Macbeth was a great king of Scotland. He wasn't the henpecked neurotic of Shakespeare's play at all. Uh, he was a confident king of Scotland. He championed the rights of the orphans and widows. He was powerful enough to go to Rome uh, to pay his respects to the Pope without worrying about uh, his, his kingdom being lost. So, you know, I, anyway, the point being, Henry then marries this girl, a young princess, uh, has the requisite children with her, a daughter who becomes the essentially the Empress of Germany and a son. And I really like him, but I suppose I admire him more than like him because he lives by a very, very rigid code. And I'm afraid this is going to put you all off him. I just built him up, but now we're going to lose all your affection for him and, and mine because it's unforgivable. Um, he lives by a code of chivalry not that chivalry is a concept at this time, but what we would consider chivalry, whereby there are certain rules. And although he only has uh, one legitimate daughter and one legitimate son, he has perhaps two dozen illegitimate children, and he uses them as pawns to marry them around Europe to better his control. And he marries a daughter, Joanna, to a, an aristocrat in France and makes her and his son-in-law trade their children with their rival so that they have hostages, so that they each behave really. And Henry I's daughter loses her temper with the hostage in her control. He's a boy and has him blinded. And the father of the blinded boy goes to Henry I and says, this is an outrage. My son shouldn't have suffered like this, and you know what the penalty is. And unbelievably, uh, Henry gives permission for his two granddaughters to be blinded in revenge. So that's when I lose my enjoyment of Henry I. He was a great, great king, but I can never get round that one because he was so powerful. You know, his daughter shouldn't have blinded the boy, but how could you give the order to have your grandchildren blinded? It's beyond belief, really. I wanted to ask, um, I have a question that's similar to an audience question, so I'm sort of gonna meld them together. But so my question was that um, many of the scenes within the pages of the book are so colorful and detailed. We were talking before we went live about how they're very cinematic. Um, how well documented were the events? Um, did it require a lot of poetic license on your part and then it sort of feeds into Catherine's question. Um, she says the amount of violence and brutality was shocking and you write about it in such detail. How did you come upon the detailed diaries, official histories? Um, so I'll, I'll leave that one for you. Yeah, well, the joy of history is that um, often fact is stranger than fiction. So. There's nothing in this book which I, I don't happen to know is true. It's, it's documented. I don't like reading books. I mean, it's fine. People love historical fiction. Uh, I, I happen not to. It's, not, it's just, I either like to read fiction or fact, <laughs> and I want to know which it is. And I hate historical fiction because I get muddled. It's my fault. You know, people who write historical fiction, I think are very clever. And I, I, I couldn't write it myself. So essentially, I hope there isn't a word in here that's not backed up by solid documentary proof. But what I try and do is glean the bits that are most interesting and hopefully resonate with the reader the most. So I, I, I remember the previous book I wrote um, was about a King of England on the run. And when I re read about it, it made me so angry, 17th century. It's sort of, you know, there's one bit where he's pretending to be a servant and he doesn't know what he's doing in the kitchen and supposedly the cook loses her temper and 
she goes red in the face and everything. But when I looked at all the documentary evidence, she may have been angry, she may have been red in the face, but there's nothing there about that. So I, I, won't, I won't presume to uh, do any of that. Uh, I, I think it's a very important thing to just give the, the straight facts in as entertaining and illuminating a way as possible. So I, I have every respect for historical fiction writers, but I, I can't do it. Actually, I can't do fiction either. I can only do nonfiction. So. Um, I know that you prepared something to read to us. If you wanted to, to take a moment mm. to do that. Yeah, well, what I thought I'd do on the healthy assumption that probably no one's, sorry, very few people on this will have read it. I thought I'd read the prologue. So the prologue is rather like an overture at a concert or whatever. And I wanted to get some of the, the human drama across about the white ship. So I've put it in, the talk we've had so far is about it as a historical event because essentially Henry I's only legitimate son dies in this terrible accident. And it changes the course of history forever because we then get the Plantagenets for uh, 330 years before the Tudors come along. It's all because of this shipwreck. But I think it's very important to help readers at the beginning to give them a flavor as to what's gonna come without giving them the whole story. So this is the prologue of the white ship. It's the first two pages and it's called A Cry in the Dark. Looking back on this, a night whose repercussions would change Europe's history forever, some claim to remember nothing more than a distant noise. It had skimmed across the surface of the icy sea, the sound waves amplified by the stillness of the water, their notes hammered taut by the frost of a late November night. It caught in the northerly wind and perhaps reached the ears of those awake on King Henry I's ship a dozen nautical miles ahead in the voyage across the channel. Those who claimed to have heard it in the dark would admit that they had no idea what it was. It was shrill and short-lived, like the distant squawk of a passing gull. The same noise had made it back to shore only a mile away in a clearer form. Some in the Norman harbour of Barfleur heard it. They were near the point where they had earlier watched the port's finest vessel, the white ship, cast off into the night. Her departure had attracted a crowd. Some present were related to those on board and had come to say their farewells, while others were intrigued by the glamour and power of those putting out to sea. These passengers included Henry I's sole legitimate son, William, the 17-year-old heir to the Kingdom of England and to the Duchy of Normandy. Two of the King's many illegitimate children who were openly acknowledged and loved by him, were also aboard the white ship. With the trio of royal children sailed much of the flower of the Anglo-Norman aristocracy, as well as leading bureaucrats who made Henry's realm run smoothly and celebrated knights who kept the peace while protecting its borders. The distinguished passengers had spent much of the afternoon and evening in the harbor, drinking hard and encouraging the crew to join in the revelry. Those in Barfleur who heard the noise assumed the merriment was reaching, reaching a crescendo on the white ship out at sea and headed for the warmth of home, unsurprised and unconcerned by the cry in the dark. In fact, what these witnesses to history had heard at sea and on land was a collective scream for help. The passengers of the white ship had gone from wild festivity to dire panic in an instant when they realized the crunch that had brought the vessel to a grinding halt was a rock. A rock that had pierced the timbers, leaving a gaping hole and allowing water to pour in. This caused the white ship to heave to one side, making her spill her human cargo into the shockingly cold sea. Perhaps the lowliest of those on board was Barreau, a butcher from Rouen who had pursued his social superiors onto the ship, determined to get outstanding bills settled. Barreau clung to part of the white ship's mast. Then, despite the weight of his saturated goatskin tunic, he hauled himself from the freezing waves onto this life-saving perch. Next to him clambered Geoffrey de Legle, 
a nobleman who was one of the king's illustrious knights. The unlikely pair had rescued themselves from drowning, but now they lay vulnerable to the extreme cold. They shivered uncontrollably. In the moonlight, they watched as their companions cried out and thrashed in the water, desperate for life. Barreau would later note William, the prince, getting safely away in the white ship's small boat. The quick-thinking royal bodyguards had bundled him into it and were rowing hard for land, aware that their sole duty in this unfurling disaster was to preserve the life of the king-to-be. They'd even left the royal treasure chest behind in the white ship's hold. As William headed quickly to safety, Barreau and Delegla watched with mounting horror as the tragedy around them played out. So that's the way to set the scene for this book, because I've left a lot of cliffhangers. So you, you all now know that it doesn't end very well for the prince, but you don't want to give that away in, 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 a, in a prologue. But you want to give... It's a book about a shipwreck. You have to give a flavor of that shipwreck uh, to the people who are reading it. And, and it, I, I find it intensely moving to think of this totally benign evening of celebration. You know, they're coming back to England in triumph, these people. King Henry I has finally defeated the King of France, uh, the wonderfully named Louis the Fat of France. And he's coming back in total triumph. And in fact, bizarrely, the captain of the white ship is the son of the captain of the Mora, which was William the Conqueror's flagship when he captured England in 1066. So there's so many echoes of the, this great sort of medieval period. You know, you've got the grandson of William the Conqueror dying on board the greatest ship of its age, the white ship. And the people ashore hearing this, the, sc the, sc the screams for help from people and not realizing that it's what it is. They think it's just people being drunk on a boat. So, um, where is it? Can you tell us anything about the Institute of Digital Archaeology's dive to what is thought to be the wreckage of the white ship last July? Did you get to personally see it? Yeah, I did go on it. I don't know if we really found, I don't know what we found. So I, it was last summer and there was a dive off the coast of Normandy at the right sort of spot. And we certainly found a bit of ancient boat, but we don't know yet what it was. So what I would say is it, it, so extraordinary about this whole period is that this was, this was known at the time to be an incredibly important event. All the chroniclers at the time write about this, the death of the heir to the throne is such an extraordinary thing. And I, going back to something I said earlier, it seems to me that most of the chroniclers who covered it saw it as some judgment by God. And some of them pointed to the fact that Henry I's wife, the Scottish princess Matilda, who I mentioned earlier, probably shouldn't have married him. It seems quite possible that she had uh, been a novice at a nunnery. And she said in her defense that she'd only adopted the uh, clothes of a, of a nun to save herself from ravishing by Norman knights. That's possible. It's also possible that she wanted to be a nun. This was a totally acceptable career for a high-born woman at this time. If she had been planning to be a nun, it would have been impossible for her to have married because the essential union as a nun is with uh, God. So you can't then decide not to be a nun and then marry somebody who's gonna be King of England. Um, that would not be okay. And at the same time, the chroniclers were looking for another reason. Who knows anything about this William, the prince who dies age 17. Uh, so we find a lot of the chroniclers turn against him. They assume there must have been something fundamentally flawed about him, and that's why God punished him, because why else would he take the life of an innocent? So we're dealing with, you know, when you're looking for the wreck of the white ship, you're, you're actually looking for an answer to something that exists in the nine, a 900-year-old mind, 
which is all of the intricacies that are bound up in the loss here. The practical loss was very clear. You're dealing with the death of an heir with no other substitute. Now, Henry I, when he lost his son, had already lost his wife a couple of years before. So there he is, he's widowed. Nobody wants to tell him about this appalling loss at sea. He has a couple of days where he's wondering more and more concerned as to where everyone is. He's waiting for them to join him in England. He's crossed over the channel himself just in another ship. He's gone in his usual vessel. And then one of his nephews realizes he's got to tell the king about this disaster, but he doesn't want to do it himself. Henry I has this terrible temper. And so he bribes a little boy, a page at the court to give the bad news. And this little boy blurts it out, he's so panicked. And Henry I hears about the loss, not only of his legitimate son, but his two illegitimate children and lots of his relatives and his great generals and his great bureaucrats, etc. And he bellows like a sort of wounded bull and falls to the floor and has to be helped out of the room and taken to his bed and stay there for a long time. And one of the first thing he decides to do is to remarry and try and produce another male heir. Now we don't know what was what in terms of um, the king's health at this time. He was in his fifties, which was quite old at this period. He marries a much younger lady. She's called Adelisa of Louvain. Uh, she's known as the fa fair maiden of Brabant. She's known for her good looks. And she is kept with the king for a very long time no children appear. Now we know this has probably got nothing to do with Adelisa. Um, she, after the king dies, marries again and has six children. Um, so maybe the king had just reached the end or was depressed or whatever it was. Um, but with the white ship sinking with the only heir and the king then not able to produce a, 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 a second heir, it's the end of the line. So as I mentioned, you know, William the Conqueror has four sons. The only one to have a son to survive uh, this tragedy is Robert, the eldest son, who by this stage is a prisoner in Wales. Uh, and his son is on the loose. So this is the, another grandson of William the Conqueror called William Quito, a very dramatic and charismatic young man. But he dies in a bizarre accident. Um, during warfare, he doesn't get killed by a, a, a sword or an ax, but by a splinter. He gets a splinter in his hand and, and that uh, he gets septicemia and dies. Um, so you're dealing with this extraordinary moment in history soon after the White Ship, where William the Conqueror had four sons, but he has no legitimate grandchildren. And I say legitimate, it does matter at this time uh, William the Conqueror was illegitimate and was accepted as Duke of Normandy as a young boy. But then things changed you know, in, in about the, in the 1070s onwards, the papacy in Rome reestablishes its uh, grip on society, high society in Europe. And one of the things it sticks with is the sanctity of marriage. And so it makes it impossible for kings or noblemen to pass on their possessions to illegitimate sons. It's just not allowed anymore. And you see, you know, you see the papacy reestablishing its control. It brings about the first crusade at the end of the 11th century in which the Pope is the leader and the kings of Europe have to serve him as soldiers. So this is, this is really key to this story because Henry I I touched on has many, many illegitimate sons, but none of them are capable of taking the place of the one son who is legitimate, who drowns on the white ship. It looks like um, there are quite a few questions coming in and I keep seeing hands going up. Just a reminder, if you do have a question, please submit it to the Q&A and we'll try to get you an answer. Um, so Lord Spencer, I wanted to ask, there's such beautiful artwork surrounding this period of history and I'm wondering, you do have some artwork in your book. How did you select the pieces that were included there? Yes. Well, it's very important to try and connect with the age. So I have got, 
So for instance, I got a painting in the book of William the Conqueror, which was done well after his death, because frankly, there are none around that I've come across of him from, you know, 1070, 1080. But the, the, there's some beautiful uh, drawings done of Henry the uh, First in the 12th century, showing him coming to terms with the death. You know, he looks totally traumatized, coming to talk terms with the death of his children on the white ship. And I, I think it's very important when you can to put in illustrations from the time. So one of the, the, the final third of the book is about the anarchy that overtakes England because of this shipwreck and the competition between um, the daughter, the one other legitimate child Henry I has is a daughter called Matilda, who Henry wanted to become uh, queen after he died. And it's quite interesting in terms of whatever we want to call it, gender politics or whatever it is, that um, even though Henry I was this incredibly powerful uh, figure, very sort of uh, dominant. And if there was a movie of the white ship, I, I think we're thinking Russell Crowe here. Um, but if you think of a sort of very powerful man, he insists that his bishops and barons look at his one legitimate daughter, Matilda, as his successor. Um, and they all agree in front of the king because they're frightened of him. But as soon as he dies in at the end of 1135, they all sort of forget their oath, and they turn to this man, Stephen of Blois. Stephen of Blois is a, another grandson of William the Conqueror through, through, a, through a, uh, a daughter of the Conqueror. And he has the distinction of being the most high-born person to get off the white ship. So that's why it's called the white ship, this book. It covers a, a, a lot of different questions. But Stephen of Blois got on the white ship the night of its fateful voyage, his final voyage. And then luckily for him, got a very upset stomach and gets off the ship. Because can you imagine, you know, that the, the, the journey across the channel takes 10 or 12 hours and you don't want the uh, embarrassment of a, an upset stomach for all that period. So he gets off. And so when Henry I dies, and he dies in very strange circumstances, Henry I was not a big eater and drinker. He kept a very strict regime and his doctors told him he must always eat very plain food. Um, but he had been out hunting with his friends uh, at the end of 1135 after a very difficult year politically. And he has this banquet and they eat lampreys. Now lampreys, if you look them up, they're pr pretty unpleasant looking animals. Um, they look a bit like an eel. Uh, they have no teeth. They sort of ingest their, their, their food through sucking it in. They're, they're disgusting looking things. But they were quite useful if you were a, a, a royal or aristocratic uh, person in this period, because there are a lot of times when you're not allowed to eat flesh because of strictures from the church or whatever. Um, and you, you, you could eat a, a lamprey and, it, it, and load it up with sauces and it could sort of pass for meat. Anyway, he, they're very oily, very rich, and he dies from that. As soon as the news of his death comes, Stephen, this very lucky survivor of the white ship because he didn't get on it, uh, zips across the channel and seizes the throne of England. And so you enter this period of civil war, um, the 19 years of civil war between when Henry I dies and Henry II, the first Plantagenet comes to the throne, are among the bloodiest in the history of, uh, of Britain. And you know, the, the monks write about this period as saying it's the time when uh, God forgot England and the land was bubbling with blood and all sorts of very dramatic statements. So you're, you're, you're dealing with a, a, the consequences of one shipwreck uh, changing the, the, the course of the history of England, but also leading to a terrible period of, of butchery and, uh, and bloodbaths. So I do want to ask a couple more. There's so many questions. Um, let's see. Uh, Savan asks, is there a reason all of Henry the first children traveled together instead of separately as a safeguard against the tragedy? Well, it's a good question. So he had a lot of children. Um, I think the white ship, you know, I, I think we really do. I, I, we have to look at this as the Titanic of its day. 
It was a very glamorous ship. We know it was white. We know that the Normans at this period were very closely descended from the Vikings. So therefore I've looked it all up. So essentially a white, uh, white was a, 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 a color of celebration. So it probably wasn't a warship. It was one that people used as a sort of rather glamorous way of sailing across the channel. Um, people were very scared of the sea. And when people look back at the sinking of the white ship, they looked at how some monks had come to bless the vessel before it set sail, which was quite common for a very important boat. Uh, but the drunken passengers on board had chased the monks away. And this was seen as a way of uh, upsetting God and, and losing protection. So crossing the water was always fearsome. If you look at maps at this time, you'll realize, of course, I mean, if you think about it, I hadn't thought about this before, but nobody knew what was under the water because you couldn't possibly tell. Um, so the medieval mind saw the sea as a terrifying place full of sea wolves, sea lions. I mean, real wolves and real lions that happen to live under the sea. Uh, so there were other children that traveled on other vessels that night, uh, but three of them ended up on the same one. So it was very, very bad luck, but they would have thought there's no chance. In fact, we know this. So um, William, who died on this uh, voyage, his uncle was called William Rufus. He was the King of England after William the Conqueror. And somebody said to him, oh, you ought to be careful going across the channel at this time of year. And this is before the white ship. He said, well, no king or prince is gonna die in a shipwreck. It just seemed ridiculous. So I think you're talking about overconfidence uh, and uh, that's probably the simple, simplest reason for this. Um, with the death of William, there was a chance for there to be an English queen. Had Empress Matilda been allowed to take the throne as Queen of England, do you think there would have been less of a stigma against female rulers going forward? Yes, you see, it's quite interesting with Matilda. So Matilda is the elder sister and the only sister of William the Prince who drowns. And it's quite clear that she has a lot of the ability and strength of her grandfather, William the Conqueror, and her father, Henry I. And I, I fear it's only because of her gender that she didn't get the chance that uh, was meant to come her way to rule in her own right. Now, part of the problem at this period for a woman assuming the throne on her own, as opposed to as the wife of a king, was uh, because a lot of the people at this time saw the ruler uh, of England or other countries as somebody who was gonna lead them into battle. So kings were expected to be in the front line of any battle. And it was unimaginable for uh, the medieval mind to see a woman being chopped up at the head of her army. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way making excuses, but I, I, if you read the literature, they really couldn't get their head around that possibility. But to be honest, Matilda's an incredibly strong and interesting woman. There was a civil war, as I mentioned, effectively from the death of Henry I uh, for 19 years. And every time Matilda seems certain to be defeated, captured, um, she shows unbelievable resilience. There's one point where she is holed up uh, in the middle of winter, snow everywhere. It, this is a very Game of Thrones scene, but it's real life. Uh, and she is stuck in a cast, the castle at Oxford. There is no way out as far as anyone can see. Uh, enemy soldiers all the way around and her own garrison have had enough. They haven't been paid, they haven't been fed. Uh, it seems like they're ready to hand her over. Uh, but she says no. And she tells the two knights who she can most rely on. She says, we're going to make a break for it essentially. And in this winter landscape, she and they put on white sheets over themselves. They're lowered down the outside of the wall of the castle at Oxford and drop into the snow and manage to get away. It's incredible. Even her enemies found her resilience incredible. Uh, it's interesting, this attitude to women was very judgmental, very unforgiving. 
the moment where she was literally on the point of going to her coronation, she's having a feast before going, uh, people are upset with her. So there are three men who support her claim. One's a King of Scotland, who's an uncle of hers. Uh, one's an illegitimate half-brother who's a brilliant soldier. And another one is a, the leading bishop. And they've supported her on their assumption that she would just be some sort of token ruler, but they could do the manly business as they saw it of ruling. And when she says, well, actually, no, I, you know, I will be queen and I will rule. They find that incredibly intimidating and they semi desert her and she's driven away. So the, the chroniclers at the time accuse her of arrogance, accuse her of all sorts of things, but actually they're all the, the faults that came with her bloodline. And if they were, if that arrogance or that uh, conceit or whatever they accused her of had been in her father, Henry I or William the Conqueror, those same chroniclers would have celebrated it as a very manly virtue. So yeah, it, there was a lot of gender bias at this time. And one last question tonight. Um, Personally, for me, I have been fascinated by the early Plantagenet line of kings, having been introduced to uh, Henry II, Matilda's son, in the movies The Lion and Winter and Beckett, but I had not been exposed to the sinking of the white ship. I know it's been mentioned in Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth, but why do you think there has not been more public <coughs> media surrounding this wreck, considering its colossal impact on European history? I, I think, well, certainly over here, I, I, I don't know the American education system very well, but I, I, I think, so I, I mentioned uh, near the beginning, so I, I'm 57 when I was growing up, uh, general history was uh, uh, absolutely obligatory. Now history is a, an optional subject. And if I was a history teacher and I wanted to get people into my uh, class, I would probably skip over the tricky bits and over here, people have basically taught Hitler and Henry VIII, um, and that's sort of it. And that's not a criticism, that's just the way they survive and pay their mortgage. So the, the finer bits, I mean, I've, I've written seven books, and I, I always look for these, I think, these wonderful moments in history which say so much. You know, this is an accident, and it's an accident that's changed the whole of history since. If this ship hadn't gone down and assuming that uh, William had had his children, we wouldn't have had uh, Richard the Lionheart, wouldn't have Magna Carta, you wouldn't have any of the Tudors, wouldn't have Henry VIII, you wouldn't have Queen Elizabeth II. You know, we're talking about an entirely parallel universe which would have happened if this one shipwreck hadn't happened. And to me, that is so fascinating about human fragility uh, one shipwreck changing the course of human history. That's really interesting to me. So, but I think going back to your question, can you base a term's work around a, a shipwreck? Probably not. Um, but I was mentioning to you before we went uh, live on this, that somebody's approached me and they want to use uh, this book as the launch to quite a big series on the Plantagenets, etc. So I don't know. It, it is standalone in its own right. Not my book, but the episode is of such monumental importance that I'm, I'm very glad, you know, even this tiny spotlight I put on it, it's just so nice to bring it back to people. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Lord Spencer. Uh, we do want to be respectful of your time. Um, so we'll start wrapping things up. There are so many questions that we would be here all night and I know it is later for you where you are. Um, this event was made possible by gifts to the New Haven Public Library Foundation. If you enjoyed the discussion, please consider making a donation at nhfpl.org backslash donate. Um, this does help support our collections, our programs and services at the library throughout the year. 
Um, a survey will appear in your browsers after you exit the Zoom tonight. Uh, we do appreciate all feedback. We do take it into um, consideration to inform our future programs and services. Um, and please join us again on Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll be welcoming author Gabriela Garcia to discuss her best-selling novel of Women in Salt. You can register for this on all of our upcoming programs by visiting our website at nhfpl.org. Um, and finally, once again, Lord Spencer, thank you so much. It's truly a delight to speak with you. Um, we were a little nervous, um, but you're so down to earth and, and so easy to talk to. So we really hope you'll, you'll come visit us again, perhaps when you have another book out. I'd love to. Thank you so much. It was great fun to do. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.